This is a lecture on kinetic energy. It says, I like to move it, move it, with moving being the key to all kinetic energy. It says, all change is not growth, as all movement is not forward, by Ellen Glasgow. So, let's take a look at kinetic energy with our learning goals. So, it says, first, you should be able to identify the factors that determine kinetic energy. So, what what is required for kinetic energy to be present? You should be able to relate work, which we learned in the previous lesson, to kinetic energy, which we're learning in this lesson. And you should be able to use the formulas Ke equals 1 half mv squared and W equals delta Ke. So let's go ahead and take a look at our first topic. And it says, <clears throat> let's get moving. So this is the experiment that you've already done. In the experiment that you've already done, you put a hanging mass over the edge and you had it pull the car through the gates. And the whole purpose of this was to say, okay, I'm applying a force because this thing right here is exerting a force. It's pulling this car with that force F and it's pulling at a certain distance between the photo gates or D. So you had this FD term. In other words, you calculated the work that you were exerting on the car. And what you did is you actually, you actually used these photo gates to figure out what the velocity was here and what the velocity was there. <clears throat> You also knew the mass of the car. So inadvertently, what you were doing is you were proving our first theorem by saying that the force times the distance was actually equal to the change in what we call the kinetic energy. It allows you to predict it. And conservation of energy is the reason why. No matter what you do, energy must be conserved in a closed isolated system. You say, well, wait a second, I actually found a little bit of difference. Yes, you found a little bit of difference because of something that we call friction that we did not account for. Now, we tried to reduce it as much as possible, but you're still going to see a little bit of discrepancy between the two. Realistically, the conservation of energy occurs in the system. <clears throat> So, it says the work must equal the change of another type of energy. We said the velocity increased, so since the velocity increased, we say kinetic energy. And this is called the work energy theorem. We li I like to call it the work kinetic energy theorem because it's dealing specifically with kinetic energy. And what it says, it says the amount of work that you do is equal to the change in kinetic energy that an object will um, have. And it makes a lot of sense. If you have a car that is at rest because it's out of gas, and all of a sudden it starts to move, the only reason it starts to move is because there's somebody behind the car actually pushing the car. Whenever you push the car, you're doing work on it, and as a result, it changes velocity. So, this delta Ke, first of all, anytime you see the term delta, remember that means change. So in our case, delta Ke stands for the change in kinetic energy. Uh, it is an energy. Just as all energies are measured in joules, this one is measured in joules. Uh, the kinetic energy cannot be measured directly. It's got to be a combination of two directed, two measured things. So because of that, we say that it is actually calculated, just like work is calculated. So let's take a look at this first one. It says, uh, example A1, what is the final kinetic energy of a car when a net force of 100 newtons is exerted on a car initially at rest over 200 or excuse me over 25 meters so you are looking for the final kinetic energy okay so I'm gonna say ke and I'm gonna put a little F here just to say that it's final okay we are given the net force we are given the distance and we're also actually given this right here this rest term so if you were to look I could say the force is equal to 100 newtons you could say that the distance was 25, and we are trying to solve for the final kinetic energy. <clears throat> so our equation is work is equal to the change in kinetic energy. Now remember, for anything, the change, the change in anything is always the final minus the initial. So Ke final minus Ke initial. So we can say work is equal to Ke final minus Ke initial. And in this case, work is force times displacement. So you have your equation in an expanded out version. So I can do force times distance, or 100 times 25 is going to equal Kef minus and then you get stuck here like but I don't know the initial kinetic energy kinetic energy remember from the first presentation is the energy of movement 
When an object is at rest, it is not moving. Therefore, it has zero kinetic energy to begin with. So what I can say now is that the final kinetic energy that an object has is equal to 2,500 joules, which is the work that was done on the car to begin with. The next example says sketch the shape of a force versus change in kinetic energy graph. Okay, whenever you're sketching the shape of a graph, you always want to start out with the equation. So the equation that we have here is W equals, uh, excuse me, yeah, W equals delta KE. And you say, okay, well, my equation doesn't actually have anything to do with that because I want to know about force. So we will expand it out to force times displacement equals change in kinetic energy. Okay. And you say, well, that's not particularly helpful here um, because I've still got this distance term. Remember, whenever you are looking at a graph, it has to be between two variables. It is understood that you say that the second variable is constant at this point. So this right here, this d term, is going to go ahead and just go away. It's still there, but it's not going to be a part of the graph because we're going to consider it to be a constant. So since it is constant, we can now take the, the equation f equals delta ke. In fact, it's not really good to say an equal there. We'll say it's proportional to because it's not equal to each other anymore but we're saying they go up together. Now I need to decide which one of these is my x variable and which one is my y. Remember on the x variable is the, on the x axis is the one that you change in an experiment. And you can change the force that's exerted on an object and as a result there is a change in kinetic energy. So force would go on the bottom and we would put force in newtons. Okay, on the left we would put change in kinetic energy and we would put joules and that would be on the left right there. So now we look at our equation. So this right here is an x value, this right here is a y value, so you can kind of set it up like that. What does a y equals x graph or an x equals y graph looks like? It is a linear graph. So what you're saying, that's a terrible linear graph, it's a straight line graph. So as a result of the straight line graph you're saying with every doubling of the force you're doubling the change in kinetic energy. With every tripling of the force, you're tripling the change in kinetic energy. So it's a direct relationship. This one says you have a 1200 watt motor that operates at full power to accelerate a 500 kilogram car for eight seconds. So when you do this, it says what is the change in the kinetic energy of the car? And then it says assume the motor is 100% efficient. So we are trying to figure out what the change in kinetic energy is. So if we look at what we've got, we have a power because it's a motor and it's 1200 watts. We are trying to accelerate a 500 kilogram car for eight seconds. And it says, what is the change in kinetic energy? Okay, so if we look at our equation, our relationship between work and change in kinetic energy is W equals delta KE. Now, I don't exactly have the power, so I need to look at another equation, and I need to know where to go. If you look, power is a key here. I'm going to somehow have to put in power equals work over time into this equation. And if you look, I want to be able to rearrange it for something else. And if you look, I can say I can multiply both sides by T, and when I do that, I get work equals power times time, which is great because I can substitute that in here and I can now say power times time is equal to the change in kinetic energy. And if you look, I have power and I have time. So I can substitute those in there and I can say, okay, uh, 1200 times 8 equals change in kinetic energy. Whenever you multiply that out, you would get like 9,600, well, excuse me, 9,600 joules would equal my change in kinetic energy. And people say, but wait a second, you didn't do anything with 500 kilograms. Remember, 
there are cases in which you're going to be given too much information. The information is meant for you to try and expand it out. I could have asked you to find the acceleration in this particular case, um, and that way you could have used that, but, but it's irrelevant for this particular question. And you need to be able to recognize and say, there's, there's something that I don't need here. So we've talked around the concept of kinetic energy, and we've said that it's the energy of movement. But we need to expand on this definition of kinetic energy to see how the, the, the work is influencing it. Because, yes, it's an energy of movement. Yes, as you push something, it's, it's increasing its, chain, its kinetic energy, its energy of movement. But how could the velocity of the car change if you put a mass on the top of the car? So, so we have this situation, but what if I were to put it here? Okay, if I put another mass right here, would we expect the car to have the same change in velocity as it goes through the photogates? And the answer is no. Even though I exert a force on it over a certain distance or did work, this the mass of this particular car is going to matter in terms of determining the velocity of between these two cars. So it's not quite as simple as what we said before where, okay, I increase the work and therefore I'm going to increase the energy of movement. Um, you can't quite take it out to velocity quite yet, which is what we really want to do to be able to relate it to what we learned earlier this semester. So now we have the energy, the kinetic energy, and that says our equation Ke equals one half mv squared. Ke stands for kinetic energy, and that is defined as the energy of movement, and it is equal to one half the mass velocity squared. So in order for an object to have kinetic energy, it must have mass, which all objects that we we're going to study this year have mass and it must be moving in other words it must have a velocity that is not zero okay it can have a really small velocity it can have a really high velocity but it must have a velocity so this right here is your kinetic energy equation and once again kinetic energy can be calculated from mass which can be measured with a triple beam balance and then it can also, you can use a photogate or a meter stick to figure out the velocity. One of the things that you need to realize, though, is that kinetic energy is once again an energy, so it is measured in joules. All energy is measured in joules. Okay. So, example B1. It says you have a 2,000 car, kilogram car that runs out of gas and comes to a stop. The car must be pushed uh, to the nearest gas station 500 meters away. A force of 200 newtons is applied for 10 meters. What is the final velocity of the car? So this is actually a question that's going to require us to do the work energy theorem and our new knowledge of what kinetic energy actually is. So what I want you to do is we take a look and say, okay, we have a 2,000 kilogram car. It's at a stop. So if it is at a stop, that's going to come into play in just a second. So the car must be pushed to the nearest gas station. 500 meters away, a force of 200 newtons is applied for 10 meters. What is the final velocity of the car? So we're trying to figure out what the final velocity of the car is. So if you kind of draw this out, this car is at a stop, and you've got somebody who's got to exert a force on it, and they've got to push it 500 meters away, but what it says, it says it only pushes it for 10 meters. So although there's several, um, or there's two dif different distances here, this one is irrelevant because it's saying you only exert the force for 10 meters. Even though it's 500 meters away, you're only doing the force for 10 meters, so that's what's important. So you have work, no, excuse me, you have mass is 2,000 kilograms. You have a force of 200 newtons. You have a distance or displacement of 10 meters. Okay. This, this is also really key here, this, this stop term. So even though it says it comes to a stop, realize that that is the initial starting point before you push. So the initial velocity of the car is zero. So now let's look at what we've got. Our equation is W equals delta KE. Now, I'm going to have to expand both sides of this equation. So instead of work, I'm going to put what work equals or force times distance. Okay, instead of delta Ke, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put one half m vf squared. Okay, in other words, one half the mass times the final velocity squared. What that represents is that represents the final kinetic energy minus one half m vi squared. 
which represents the initial kinetic energy. So you can start to plug in the numbers now and you can say, okay, you can plug the number. But what, what's really important in this particular case is you realize that the initial velocity was zero. So if I take zero and square it and multiply it by m, no matter what m is, it's going to be zero. And then I multiply it by half and it's still going to be zero. So what you should realize is this whole second term right here is going to cancel out. And I'm just left with fd equals one half mvf squared. So now we can plug in our numbers and we can say, okay, well, force, this is 200 e times distance, 10, equals 1 half mass, which is 2,000, and then final velocity squared. So you've got 200 times 10, which is 2,000, and you've got 2,000 here. Since I have 2,000 on both sides of the equation, it will cancel out. And what I'm left with now is 1 equals 1 half Vf squared. Okay. Multiply both sides by 2. And you get 2 equals Vf squared. You need to take the square root of both sides. And you get the final velocity is the square root of 2, which is 1.414 meters per second. This is example B2, and it says you have a 10 kilogram rock which has dropped off a 14 meter tall cliff. What is the kinetic energy of the rock just before it strikes the ground? So this is an interesting question because it makes us uh, have to know a little bit of information from the first six weeks, and that is our initial kinematics equations. Because it says, what is the kinetic energy? So I'm trying to solve for Ke. And in order to solve for Ke, I need to know the formula kin kinetic energy is one half the mass times the velocity squared. So that's what I really need to do in order to be able to solve this. But the problem is, is that it doesn't tell me the velocity. Instead, it tells me the distance. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and, and have to solve for the final velocity right before it strikes the ground. Whenever we do this, we can say you have a rock that is at the top of the cliff and it has an initial velocity of zero. We were interested in the final velocity of the rock right before it strikes the ground because I want to know what the kinetic energy is right before it strikes the ground. If I asked for the kinetic energy at the top, it would just be zero because the rock is initially not moving. So because of this, I need to know what this final velocity, or this VF2 term is, not VF squared, but the final velocity at the end. So I know that the initial velocity was zero. I'm interested in finding the final velocity I know that the acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity, or negative 9.8 meters per second squared. And I know that the displacement of the rock in this particular case is going to be a negative 14 meters because it falls from the top to the bottom. So I can say uh, that I do not have any sort of use for time. So remember if you do your if dat, ifdat, you have the initial, you have the final, you have the displacement, you have the acceleration, and you do not care for the time. So because of that, you're going to choose the equation that does not have time in it, or Vf squared equals Vi squared plus 2ad. Okay, Our initial velocity term is zero, so that term is going to cancel out. So instead, what I'm going to be left with is the final velocity squared, which is what I'm looking for, is going to be equal to 2 times negative 9.8 times negative 14. And when you take those and you multiply them out, you get, hold on just a second, 2 times 9.8 times 14, you get 200, you get the final velocity squared is equal to 274 .4 meters per, well there's no unit really at this point. You've got to take the square root of both sides to solve for the velocity and when you do that you get, hold on a second, you end up getting 16.6 .6 meters per second. Now when you do that that's not really what you're looking for, remember. Really what you're looking for is the kinetic energy. So what you can do then 
is you now have the final velocity which allows you to use the equation ke equals one half mv squared so you would plug in you'd say equals one half the mass or the mass is 10 and then you have the velocity squared term now I would highly recommend that you not use 16.6 .6 here because that's a rounded version of, of what we did remember the final velocity squared is actually a more accurate answer because we didn't have to round it it was actually like 16.56502333 and it keeps going so to get the most accurate answer I actually want to take my final velocity squared term and put it in here because it's already squared so you put in 274.4 Whenever you do that, you can now multiply it out. Remember, I've already squared the velocity, so I don't have to deal with it anymore. So I would just take that and multiply it by 10, and then divide by 2, and I get a kinetic energy of the rock just before it strikes the ground of 1,372 joules. Now, we're actually going to talk about a little bit easier way to do this after the next lesson because now we're going to talk about gravitational potential energy in the next lesson it makes it a little bit easier but for now you can do it using kinematics the last question that we're going to talk about now says you have a six excuse me six kilogram bowling ball thrown with a velocity of 20 meters per second how fast must a 0 0.140 kilogram baseball be thrown to have the same kinetic energy? And this is one of these questions that you tend to see on a test uh, where it's got twice as much mass and it has to have half as much velocity as what most people think because it's got twice as much mass. So here, if you were to look at the mass ratios, um, 6 divided by 0.14 says that it should be, this is about 43 times bigger. So the bowling ball is about 43 times more massive than the baseball. So a lot of people say, oh, okay, well, then the baseball is going to have to be moving 43 times more faster. It's not the case. I just want to tell you that that's what a lot of people think, and that's wrong before we actually do the math. So basically what I have is I have two kinetic energies here. I have the kinetic energy of the bowling ball, and I have the kinetic energy of the baseball. And because of the circumstances of the question, I know that those two kinetic energies are equal because the question says they have the same kinetic energy. Normally they would not. Like if you were doing an actual experiment with a baseball and a bowling ball, they would almost never have the same kinetic energy. But in this particular case, they do. So what I can do is I can say the kinetic energy of the baseball, put base, equals the kinetic energy of the bowling ball those two things are equal so now I can say one half the mass of the baseball times the velocity of the baseball squared has to equal one half the mass of the bowling ball times the velocity of the bowling ball squared if you look one half is on both sides so since one half is on both sides it cancels out you have the mass of the baseball the mass of the baseball is 0.14 kilograms. You do not know the velocity of the baseball, which is still squared. That has to equal, on the other side, the mass of the bowling ball. The mass of the bowling ball is known, and once again, the one-half canceled out. So you've got 6 times this 20 term squared. Okay, so now in order to solve for this equation or this question you're going to divide both sides by 0.14 okay because you're starting to isolate the the velocity of the baseball term so then you would go to your calculator and you say okay 6 times 20 squared divided by 0.14 and you get 1700 and well, excuse me 17142 equals the velocity of the baseball squared. Remember, you don't want the velocity squared, so you've got to take the square root of both sides. And when you take the square root of both sides, you end up getting a velocity of 131 meters per second. So even though the baseball is 43 times smaller than the bowling ball, if you were to compare their velocities, the velocities are much closer. In fact, they're only about 6.5 times different. In other words, it's actually a square root of it, of the, the mass.
So what you should take from this example is that whenever you're looking at kinetic energy, the velocity of something is much, much, much more important than the mass of an object.